Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Ask the Expert. Today, we're going to be talking about an issue that's on the vast majority of parents' minds across the globe, which is back to school during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Ashley Baldwin from the Communications Department at the Pan American Health Organization, and I am joined here today by two experts. Firstly, Nikisha Reed, who is a mom of four kids herself from Barbados. Good afternoon, Nikisha. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, live on Facebook. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Dr. Heri Eichmanns, who is the unit chief of health promotion and social determinants at the Pan American Health Organization. Good afternoon, Heri. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Nikisha. Hi, everybody online. Good to see you. So for the next 40 to 50 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking to Heri and Nikisha about going back to in-person classes during the pandemic. So it's end of September at the moment. This has been at the forefront of people's minds for the past month or two. And we know that many schools have been closed since mid-March. But countries, particularly in our region, and we're seeing it in Europe and other regions of the world too, are starting to send children back in person to school. So we want to know, is it safe? How long can we keep children out of school if we don't feel that it's safe? And how can we make sure that learning environments are as safe as possible? And that's whether children are going back to school in person. And also, you know, what's the feasibility of continuing with online education if, you know, that's, that's definitely not the case. So as per usual, we're going to be taking questions from our audience. So feel free at any point during the next 40 minutes or so to put your questions in the comments section and we will get to them as soon as possible. But first of all, I'm going to start with a difficult question for you, Heri, um, because why not? And that's the burning question that I think most parents have. You know, as many schools start to call children back to in-person classes, should we be should we be sending our children back to school? I mean, there's still no vaccine for the pan, for the for COVID nineteen. There's you know still no treatment options. Even though schools and, and governments are telling us that you know that's what we should be doing, is it really what we should be doing as parents? Well, thank you for this. I should say very different question. Um, schools are fundamental for children. I think we all agree on that and not only for children, also for the parents, for the community. So sending kids back to school is very important, but it has to be done in a safe way. And I think also everybody agrees on that. And that safe really depends very much on the context of the locality, of the country, of the municipality. If you are in a, in a city or in a village where there's a lot of transmission, it's probably not as safe and much more difficult for the school to make it safe to get children back to school. But if you are in a place where there are very few cases, um, you can definitely get kids back to school, always taking the, 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 the prevention measures that we know, uh, working with the different uh, authorities, with health, a uh, very strong conne uh, connection with the parents is important. So I would say it depends, but yes, as soon as possible, we need to try to get kids back in school in a safe way. Nikisha, you're, you're a mother of four children. Um, and we were chatting a little bit before we went live and you were telling me that they have been, until recently, they've all been learning online since mid-March. Can you tell us a little bit about what that experience has been like for you, both as a parent and what's that been like for your, for your children? Um, it's been an unusual experience, I would say, in, um, in what 2020 COVID-19 has presented to us. Um, as a world. Um, basically, as a mother um, and working alongside with my husband, um, 
you know, we went straight into action. Uh, we were seeing countries around us shutting down. We were seeing, um, we were hearing of persons coming in through the border with um, testing positive. And for us, we were, we, we were very proactive. You know, what, what should we do in order to ensure that we are prepared um, as a family should our, our borders shut down? So we had the resources to make sure that, you know, we all had devices for our children. Um, we, we did a lot of communications with them. We spoke to them about what this possibly would look like. Um, and in fact, that became our reality. So it's, it was a lot of communication, a lot of, you know, um, there's a lot of fear happening around um, in the country as to, to, to handling the situation. How would schools handle it? How would um, workplaces handle it? And it, it caused us to do a lot of thinking and searching, but a lot of conversation um, and preparation. So were, those, were your children's schools teaching online? What, what, did the, what, did the, what has education looked like for the past sort of six or so months in your household? Right. A lot of um, online learning, um, schools tapped into resources that were available via the internet. You would see um, different organizations and NGOs that probably would have had online learning structures for, for decades. Um, our schools in Barbados were now tapping into those. For some, it would be new. For others, they would have been using those resources apart in, in terms of their teaching um, mechanisms. Uh, then there was, there was also Zoom classes. So we, um, as a country, the Ministry of Education would have um, invested in Google, Google Suite. So which afforded the schools and teachers to be able to have the platform that they needed in order to, to carry out the learning that is, is necessary for the students. So a lot of schools were using Google Suite, um, even before Google Suite became accessible to everyone. Some schools already were using Zoom. I believe Zoom became the most popular platform <laughs> worldwide because of, of the nature of what was happening. Um, and you know, teachers really try their best, um, teachers are parents too. So they try their best to facilitate where they could have. Um, and when there was a live session, they sent homework, they sent assignments, you know, in terms of planning. Um, you could have seen that um, working together and coming together just to at least, at least positively inform and, and inform a positive environment for, for students and for parents and for teachers happening at that time. Um, Hedy, one of the things that Nikisha mentioned is that, you know, her family sort of saw this coming and had the resources to ensure that, you know, every child had a device, every child could access the, the education that was being provided by the school, by the Ministry of Education in, in Barbados. Um, but we know, of course, in every country in the world, and particularly in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, which you know, has some of the, the highest levels of inequality, that that isn't always the case, that there are a lot of children that don't have access to the internet, that there are a lot of children that don't have access to devices. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what are the implications if children cannot go to school? Because, you know, you mentioned that it was fundamental that we get children back to school safely, but as soon as possible. Now, why is that the case? Yeah, I know this is, this is so important uh, that we talk about this because, you know, going, um, learning, of course, is essential. And, and um, that, that big difference that you see that you, that you alluded to, you know, between what people have, how they can really um, um, follow the classes online um, because they have internet, because everybody have, has a device, because... Um, if that's not the case, if you if you see families who have only one cell phone and a TV, I mean that really creates a situation where those kids that are already in a situation of vulnerability, you know, have not had the chance to learn the same as the kids who could. So you see that those gap in education is also growing and that's very worrisome. But it goes beyond that because in many countries um, in this region, the school is also a place where children um, get food. No, they get their lunch, they get their breakfast. It really depends on what kind of school, if it's a public school, private school, and also in, in, in which community. But so this was another problem that we've seen in the region that it was not only that the kids could not get the education they needed, but 
but also uh, that they were missing out on food. And this was a big burden uh, for the parents. Now, we've already mentioned that if children don't go to school, it's also very difficult for parents to go to work. And this is another a big challenge for many, many families, single household, um, uh, single parent families, but also families that live in small spaces. How do you do if you have uh, several children there? Um, you, you can't go to work if even if you're a essential worker, if you're a nurse or if you're somebody who, who works in cleaning, that is all continued. How do you do that? So there's a lot of aspects apart from the learning aspects. And that is also something that we really need to take into account. The, the whole social psychological point, we, what we've seen, unfortunately, also a lot of, of violence, uh, an increase in violence, inter-family violence. And that is also something, you know, uh, the kids are the safest also at school. You know, that's also why schools are, are so important for that social uh, coherence, for, the, for, for safety, for services get, that can be given there. So that is another reason why um, schools uh, being open are so important. Right. You, you mentioned there a little bit about, um, you know, single parent households, particularly and juggling going to work and other responsibilities with now having to take on this role, I guess, of teacher to a certain extent. You know, of course, there's there's a teacher on the other side of the screen. Nikisha, how did you how have you coped navigating the dual roles of, of parent and teacher in this new school ecosystem what has it been like and how and how have you and your your partner been able to manage it right so um i would say i don't know if it's dual i mean you are a teacher you are a parent you are it specialist your it advisor i was um, optimistic of me was <laughs> <laughs> you, you're everything um it how did i how did i manage you know it takes a lot of structure and planning um i think the, I would I, I tend to think they, they take the positive away from any negative circumstance. So for, for my family, my husband and I, um, it's helped us with our time management. It's helped the children with their scheduling. It's helped them with their time management. So um, I'm not saying it's, it's easy. Uh, we tried many different things until we could get to that one thing that worked for us. Um, certainly in, in Barbados, what we were able to, to experience as a country for those who did not have devices, the government tried their best to get devices to those children. Um, and you know, that was was very, um, it, was, it was very resourceful and helpful to those, those families who did not have. And I would have to say, thank God for the private sector. The private sector also stepped in. They provided laptops and they provided tablets to those families who did not have. And they continue to provide, even in this back to school environment, from uniforms, you know, a number of persons were laid off. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's any one thing that I did, but there were several things that we tried in terms of our structure, in terms of our organization, in terms of speaking with your employer, um, private sector, Barbados, at least the majority of them are aware of the situation. So there's flexible working um, hours. Um, it's all about conversation and community. And certainly I'm seeing that in Barbados. Um, and where I'm from originally in Trinidad, uh, my family, they too are seeing that. Um, in Trinidad, for many years, you had, um, when you did the common entrance exam or what, the, what is now called the secondary entrance exam for school, um, C, when you did that exam and you passed, you got a laptop through the government. So there were, um, there were families who would have had the devices and for those who didn't, you know, you saw government and private sector coming along hand in hand. So it sounds like you were, um, it sounds like you were on the one hand, you know, managing your 17 plus roles very <laughs> well over the past six months. But, but on the other hand, you know, you've, I guess, been fortunate to live in a context where the private sector has been able to step in and offer devices mm -hmm. for children that, that don't have access to those. And mm -hmm. the government has been able to step in and, and also start breaching some of those gaps. Um, and given that, and given that over the course of the past six months, it, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you've gotten to a stage where, okay, we're in a flow now and, you know, all four children are learning and things are getting mm -hmm. done and we're moving forward. So when Barbados announced that 
children can now go back to school in person. Mm. What, how did you feel as a mom and what did you need from the Ministry of, of Education and the Ministry of Health and the mm. school system to reassure you that, okay, I'm going to be sending my children back to school now right. and things have been put in place to make sure that their chances of transmission, you know, haven't just shot through the roof now. Mm-hmm. How did how did you reach that decision that you were going to start sending them back? Well, from a government perspective, there was lots of consultation. Um, there was consultation among the teachers and the parent um, teachers association. There were consultation among the principals and the schools. Um, and, and a, re, a reassurance that the protocols will be upheld where there were schools in terms of their sizes um, that can facilitate social distancing. There was um, a planning and a working around lots of discussion, um, which, which helped with how us parents felt about our children going back to school. Of course, there's still some uncer- uncertainty and some uneasiness, but um, you can see that there was lots of planning taking place. There was lots of consultation taking place at every level. Um, and as a parent, for me, I've been teaching my children since we've been home together on, you know, the requirements of washing your hands, singing happy birthday, and all the thumbs, fingers, knees, toes, everything. You know, that, that whole process of washing your hands. Um, I've even tested different types of masks with them while we were on home just to, uh, to assure myself that I, they can go an eight hour day or four hour day with masks on. And I knew when they would have to have it off. So um, these are the things I needed to, to, to feel secure in um, ensuring that, okay, as far as mask is concerned, I know the type of mask that they can u- utilize. Um, I knew that they know how to wash their hands. Um, I even provided them with what I call a COVID case. It's not a pencil case, but it has everything in it from sanitizer to soap to even um, cream to moisturize your hand to wipes and everything is in there. And they know in terms of, um, you know, just sanitizing your environment. Yes, the schools are doing it and they did assure us that they have um, sanitization stations in school and extra um, soap for washing hands and that type of thing. But for me as a parent, I still need to ensure that my children had those items as well. Thank you very much. So just to recap, we're having a Facebook Live Ask the Experts session with two colleagues, Nikisha Reed, who is a mom of four kids in Barbados, and also one of my PAHO colleagues, Dr. Hedy Eichmanns, who is the Chief of the Health Promotion and Social Determinants Unit here at PAHO. We're talking about going to back to school in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you have any questions at all, feel free to put them in the comments section. Um, your organization astounds me, <laughs> Nikisha. But for parents who aren't as, you know, aren't as organized or don't have access to those particular resources, um, Hedy, what what are governments and schools doing in order to make learning safe? And what should they be doing to make learning safe? You know, we know that some classrooms are very overcrowded. Um, we know that many schools in many countries are, were under-resourced even prior to the pandemic, let alone now. So what are our recommendations for ensuring a safe learning environment for children? Yeah, I think what's key in all this is, is, is really look at um, the environment in which school is placed, you know, is it already is are a lot of cases, are a few cases when you take the situation of many Caribbean countries, they have managed by closing borders, by, by managing the situation to bring down the case numbers quite low. So then you have some clusters, etc. So you already know that the situation is acceptable for sending kids back to school. Now, what does school have to do? And it's quite a bit. And that's, that's really where it's kept very challenging. So um, you can think, uh, first of all, of course, it's the whole thing around 
um, hygiene. Uh, we already heard it, no? Having, giving kids the opportunity to wash their hands, um, which is not always that easy in a school, but you know, this is very, very important. Uh, practice hygiene, clean the surfaces, clean everything, but also very much looking at how you organize, like, have kids coming in shifts, not everybody coming in at the same time, not parents having to drop off uh, the kids at the same time or pick them up at the same time. And particularly that physical distancing, that distance is crucial. And that's also what's very difficult with children. And with adults, you can say you have to stay one meter apart and we more or less understand how much is a meter and how to do that. But with kids, particularly when it comes around playing and that these are very uh, difficult things. So you have to have teachers and other people who help uh, enforce those measures uh, that you're talking about. And then it depends um, on, on, the, on the country, some countries um, have um, um, made it an obligation for kids to wear a mask, you know, so then you have to make sure that the kids really have them. Kids under five, they really don't need that, you know, but the kids above five and, and um, they, um, in many cases, uh, depending on the, or actually above 10, particularly because between five and 10, you really see that the risk of them getting sick and the risk of them being able to spread also goes up uh, quite a bit. So that's also very important to take into account. The smaller kids are not so, so, so much of a problem. But so those uh, measures that need to be there, cleanliness, you know, having them walk in, in the same direction and not against each other, shifts, uh, taking, uh, make, creating the space in the classrooms, uh, having the teacher. Uh, um, with the space uh, from the kids because of course the adult is the one that's most susceptible in that scenario so there's a lot of those actions that have to happen at the same time brilliant uh, so we've also we've had a comment come in not a question from angela hopkins hoyt who said it's the same in guyana the government and a few public sector organizations have been coming together to provide tablets and laptops to schools um, that have children without those devices. So it sounds like, you know, we, we've, and I, and I guess we're really, you know, there's a, there's a huge spirit of solidarity in, in the region of the Americas, and it's something that, you know, Pafel reiterates constantly. And I guess this is really the time when that solidarity has been more important than ever, and having the private sector as well stepping in and doing its part to, to ensure that all children are, are taken care of. Hidi, you mentioned um, some of the implications, the negative implications of children not going to school. You mentioned, for example, the services beyond education that a lot of children receive within the context of, of school, such as meals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the case, not just in Latin America, but in many countries all over the world. Um, but I guess there's also sort of more fundamental implications of children not going to school. You know, there's been, we had a Facebook Live a couple of weeks ago on mental health. Nikisha, how did you, were your children able to cope with suddenly going from being, you know, normal? You told me you have a, a seven year old, a nine year old, a 12 year old, and a 14 year old. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I mean, how were they, how did they find suddenly going from going to school every day, interacting with teachers, having these different adults influence on their lives and also playing with their peers to, you know, were there a lot of arguments in their house? Do you think that their mental health was affected by, by not being able to access not just the educational aspect of school, but also the social aspect of school too? Correct. Um, so... At first, it was very, um, it was very challenging. I mean, they missed their friends at school and being able to have that interaction. Um, but I think children are quite resilient, and unlike us adults, they they tend to they're very fluid in terms of how they they adapt. So for me, my my elder children, I mean, being online and being social online is not a challenge. They have Instagram and they have Facebook. So um, I would have seen them using Zoom platforms and different platforms to do movie nights with their friends, um, to do game evenings with their friends. But, but my younger children, um, they too use Zoom to go online and, and uh, go on YouTube and probably watch a movie with their friends or do coloring online. I'm like, okay, wow, they, 
I mean, technology has so grown over the last couple of years. Um, it's just about adapting and, and we encourage that. However, um, I would have to say when we were in that period of lockdown and we couldn't go anywhere, that's where I saw, you can see the, the burden of COVID being a, a challenge within the family. And what we, tend, what we did, we, we went outside. So in terms of our schedule, you know, it was either 2.30 or 3 o'clock every day. Everybody has to shut down from all devices and let's hit outside. And we joined them. My husband and I joined them outside, whether it be football, cricket, dance, whatever. We were there um, doing activities with them and being more engaging with them. I would say one positive thing that has come out of COVID-19 and being on lockdown and being a work from home mom with my children would be our, our ability to bond um, and have that social interaction with your child that you tend not to get because they are away from school. Right. And uh, we just had another comment come in from Gabriela Barrantes, who says, hello from Costa Rica. Here kids are taking classes from home. I think it's the best solution for now. So I guess that plays into a lot of what you were saying, Kitty, about, you know, it completely depends on the epidemiological context of the country as to whether presential school is, you know, the best foot forward at the moment, or if it's still better to, to have online classes. And certainly the Caribbean, many of the Caribbean countries, you know, they can start to think about perhaps right. going back to school. You mentioned also one thing that was quite interesting that I wondered if you could expand on a little bit. And that was, um, you know, we've spoken a lot about the measures that, that PAHO and WHO recommends for children returning to school. But you also mentioned that when it comes to social, to physical distancing, when it comes to things like mask wearing, if that's mandated, et cetera, et cetera, that is quite difficult to police, for want of a better word, when you're dealing with seven-year-olds or five-year-olds, for example. Um, so what are our recommendations for keeping teachers safe? Because teachers, you know, like many of our frontline medical workers are, are probably a lot more exposed than, you know, than I certainly am working here from home and I have been since March. So how, how are we keeping our teachers safe and what are our recommendations for that? Yeah, this is crucial um, because the teachers, of course, they are the adults and they are more susceptible. Um, so um, the main thing, and this is actually the most important thing in general, is to this, the physical distancing. So the, the, the teachers should not be closer than a meter to the child. Because if you start to say that teachers have to wear a mask, um, um, that is more complicated because it's with, um, um, you know, kids need to see a face to, to understand. It's much more difficult. So in some situations, some countries do recommend that teachers wear a mask because there's too much um, transmission going on in the community. But in most cases, um, when countries wait until that transmission has gone down, the most important thing is that teachers do, of course, the frequent hand washing, the, the basic, you know, sneezing in your elbow, if hopefully, uh, and particularly important is that they don't come to school when they're sick. And this is also very important for the kids. Um, and this is also difficult because uh, luckily the Caribbean has a nice climate and uh, but still uh, you see already in, 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 in Europe we're having a lot of discussions about what happens when a kid uh, gets a, a, a small um, a, a common cold. Now, do you keep it home? Do you send it to school? And these are very, very difficult discussions. And this is also something I think important to mention that we know a lot about this virus that we didn't know at all only eight months ago, but there's also still a lot of things we don't know. And since um, particularly in this region, schools haven't really been open, you can not learn from that. Uh, we have learned and we are learning from what happens in other regions, but we cannot really learn um, about how, uh, in, in what's happening really in the school environments. We've seen in general that there are very few instances where the school has really been a big source 
uh, of contamination for the community. Or there's very few um, um, descriptions of outbreaks or kids getting um, COVID in school. So that's good news. But there's also always taking into account that we um, that there's that still things we learn every day. Right. And we know, of course, that children, you know, in the vast majority don't fall within the high risk or the, the high risk category for severe disease. So that's, you know, adults, older adults over the age of 65, people with comorbidities, we'll say at Vajo, but pre-existing conditions like hypertension, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it could be argued, although of course, like you mentioned, Hedy, um, we're constantly learning about COVID-19. It's, it's a very new virus that children are less at risk of, um, of getting COVID-19 than some other groups. However, what if your child has a condition such as asthma or you know, even obesity, for example, you know, there's lots of campaigns about having to reduce obesity now because we know that it's linked to severe disease. Would our recommendations be the same for parents of, of those children or do we have different recommendations? Well, the, the recommendations are the same, um, but um, we need to really enforce them extremely strictly with children that, um, that have already asthma, as you mentioned. And in some cases, if this is really severe, then there might be a case of um, maybe waiting a little bit with that child in coordination with the school, depending on how well the school could really adjust and could really protect that child and protect others. So uh, this is a very, um, a very complicated question. No, how far uh, do you treat everybody the same? Or, but I think it's important that when we know that there's, that there's some children, uh, or, or for example, who live with a parent who has a very, who's severely ill, you know, these are also um, situations where you do not want to expose that parent. So that you have to really be able as a school and as a community to protect that child um, much and even, even better than, than, than other children. Thank you, Hedy. We've had another comment come in from Soma Constantine, who says, kudos to Mrs. Reed in using this critical time to bond with her children a lot of parents see technology as babysitters now is the time to exercise balance yes socializing is important but family time is important too i wanted to ask you nikisha um what does school look like now for you and your family you mentioned that today for example you have one child who's attending school so what are the protocols now? Are they going back slowly? Are they going back full time? What does what does education look like in your family now? Okay, so we have um, a blended approach to school right now. So um, my children have a, um, their timetable. Some days they are at home doing online um, learning, and then other days they go in for to face to face um, learning. So it's luckily for me, all four aligned and I'm thanking God for that um, because it will be crazy having four different timetables that did not align, but they did. And, and even so there was, um, in terms of the consultation with the schools, there was room for parents to have conversation and ask for their timetables to align with their other siblings and that type of thing. So it's communication and, and, and really tapping into network is what helps in our circumstance. And are your children, so, you know, where I'm from in Europe, there's a lot of talk about bubbles and children that are going back to school are going back to school within a bubble. So, you know, a, a certain percentage of the class that's always going back to school at the same time so that, you know, maybe there's six to 10 children associating with each other, but rarely more than that. Is that also the case in, in Barbados and in other Caribbean countries, to your knowledge? Are your children allowed to now, for example, go out to play with the members of their class? I think play looks a little different in this circumstance. I do know in terms of my younger children, um, their class size is not that large. Um, the school has split the classes into A and B. Um, and 
in terms of numbers, they're maintaining social distances, they're maintaining even beyond the, the recommended, which is six feet. Right now they're using six feet. Um, and I do know there are breaks. And in, within these breaks, I, I know the teachers are encouraging distance. How, how successful they are at that, I can't say right now. Um, this is the first week we are back out. Um, in this way, but I do know the schools are very um, concerned with and maintaining protocol and they're going to ensure that they do. Um, but my um, older children, they too are in the groups. Um, and I think older children tend to understand the circumstance of what's happening. So they will social, they meet online, but at school it's you get dropped off, you get picked back up as soon as school is over and they would connect in a different way. So. Right. So I guess it's, wa it's watch this space still a little yes. bit. The children have just gone back to school. And, and I guess, you know, policies and protocols will evolve, you know, right. as the virus, as we see what happens with the virus on the one hand, and we see how, how it works bringing children to school if a epidemiological context allows for it. Um, I have quite a tricky question for you now, Kerry, so my apologies in advance. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I recall that PAHO launched a joint report with ECLAC on, um, on really sort of the economy and COVID-19 and how we can achieve that balance. And I was just reading a, a follow-up comment from Gabriela Barrantes, who said that in Costa Rica, the Ministry of Education provides children with monthly meals to prepare at home, which you know is an interesting initiative. And I wondered, you know, one of the things that we've been calling for at PAHO WHO in order to enable people from all income levels to adhere to the, um, the public health measures. So social distancing, staying at home, et cetera, et cetera, has been that those measures need to be accompanied with socioeconomic measures as well. And I was wondering when it comes to schools and when it comes to education and, you know, for countries that aren't able to go back to school in person yet, or, you know, maybe if transmission shoots up again in perhaps in Barbados or in any country really, and children have to go back to home learning, what measures do we think can be put in place to ensure that children are protected from some of those sort of non-education issues that we discussed earlier, like, you know, eating and violence and, you know, those other things that seem to go hand in hand with these prolonged stays at home? Yeah, this is essential, um, very, very important. Um, when when um, children cannot go back to school or they have, as you say, I think very important point that you mentioned that even when schools open, they might have to close again at some point. This is going to be um, something that will be happening uh, over the coming year, at, at least, you know, where things are still going to be um, difficult. Now, um, so the main thing um, I think has to do with making sure that those children, as we have already mentioned, have the basics to learn. I think that is very important and that is a responsibility of course of, of, of the government, but also the private sector. We've seen them stepping in. Nutrition um, is a very um, important other element. Um, we've seen many countries in the region supporting parents that lost their income um, with social security um, and, and social protection measures, no? so food packages, or for example, uh, making sure that you know, people are not evicted from their homes you know, when they cannot pay the rent. So, so very uh, important social measures taken by the government have protected those families in which those children live so that they can still have their, their, their basic uh, the basic needs, uh, water, uh, electricity, uh, a house, everything met. Now the mental health, that is really, really difficult because we know that um, particularly um, where there were already problems, for example, with violence in the family or um, a person who's alcoholic in the family or there's abuse of, of, of not alcohol drugs or whatever, there's a much more risk. Now this is really difficult. So what is important 
But and then very often the teachers, they do know what happens in those families. So we've also seen programs where there is a, a, a they reach out to uh, those families. Not always they find the kids that are most at risk. And this is also very important that we've seen when children are coming back, some have really uh, suffered from that, uh, from that attention they needed. We've also seen in some places that there were always safe spaces. So there were maybe not schools, but there are some places where small groups of children can go with all the, the precautions that are needed so that they are protected um, from, uh, from what happens at home. So, but this is extremely complex because how do you intervene in a home when people are together for months at a time where people are suffering, where, where, where there's frustration, et cetera, no? And, and, and again, I, I also do congratulate you, uh, Nikisha, because you have really made the best of that situation, um, but not everybody has been able to do that because of, of, of many, many uh, different reasons. So yeah, it's, there's a lot needed to have in terms of government support that goes beyond just you know the money and, uh, and and the protection over and i think i know what your answer is going to be to this one Heri, but we've had a um we've had another question come in from adriana diaz prada who says what about if we just wait until a vaccine is ready Ooh. What do you think about that <laughs> I would say we can probably wait for quite a while, not because there will not be a vaccine. We're probably making progress on the vaccine. We still don't know how that vaccine will look. We don't know when it will come out. We don't know how many doses there's going to be. We don't know how they're going to be distributed. And a safe vaccine is something that takes time. We have not been particularly good to making those vaccines uh, in general against uh, a new virus in, in such a quick time. So uh, before everybody's protected, before what we call herd immunity, everybody has been hearing about that, where you have enough people protected so you can say, okay, now this community is safe because there's enough people who've had the vaccine. Now, until we have that, that can take quite a while. So I would say, really, let's try to work, you know, in a way that we look at our contacts, bring it down with with, with social, social uh, distancing, with physical distancing, with, with public health measures. Let's control this as much as possible. Go back to school in a way that, that, that allows kids to, you know, not be at home and not be able to learn and not having all those problems that we have been talking about and do it in, in a careful way. So I think it's really uh, would be uh, not prudent to, to really wait um, until we have a vaccine and everybody's covered because that could unfortunately still take quite a while. Right. And if you, if you want any more information about that, Adriana, if you go to our PAHO webpage, the director of PAHO, Dr. Carissa Etienne, was actually talking about vaccine development and, you know, realistically how long that might take and what countries need to do in the meantime, just on Wednesday. So all of that information and video is available on our website for, for you to have a look at and that will give you a bit more information. And, and of course, Hedy is right, you know, life needs to continue and, and children where possible can't be kept away from school indefinitely. Um, Dan Epstein has asked, uh, he said that he saw a report saying that children are suffering increased measurable stress from lockdowns. Um, was this the case in your house, Nikisha? Did you notice that your children were getting more stressed? I would, I would say it was a challenge. Um, but when I saw that challenge arising, that's, this is where conversation came in, where, where I spent individual time, whether I spent time with the boys or I spent time with the girls and my husband did the same, um, where we interacted with them, probably took them out um, outside and, you know, had, you know, that physical, those games with them and that type of thing, just to get them to think about other things other than the pressures of, of what was happening around us. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an environmentalist, so I love outdoors. I love looking at the sky and looking at the stars. So even the simple little things like that, we took, 
you go outside at night and you just gaze and you talk about the cosmos and you know just think about other things other than you know we have to wash our hands for 20 seconds every time and take off your clothes as soon as they come through the door and put it to wash you know just just find fun ways of making them feel at ease even in this situation um, because you know as we are discussing we don't know how long we're going to have this for um, it's going to be here for a while and so and every country is at different stages you know we are fortunate in Barbados that there's no community spread and I pray God that it, it will continue that way but um, you know there, there are different things that I've done in order to, to make us feel more comfortable at home and when there's there seemingly is some type of pressure you know you just unwind and, and, and do different activities, games, evening, you know, different things. And from Paco's perspective, Eddie, do we have any other recommendations beyond those that Nikisha said that she's putting into practice in her house as far as reducing stress, which is completely everyone's stressed at the moment. And of course, you know, for children who might also be struggling to understand, particularly at a very young age, what's going on. Do we have any recommendations for parents about how to, to help them better cope with that stress? Well, I think Nikisha really is doing everything uh, that, that, we, that should be done. And I think she is absolutely a great example in that. It really very much, the stress of the children very much depends on, on the parents and how well those parents can cope with that. And, and that is unfortunately um, um, also a reality that not all parents have no, the physical means, but also the mental and the psychological means to accompany the children. So, um, yeah, that, 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 that is something um, uh, where the support for the parents also is very important. It's not, but because the parents are the one who in the end make sure, uh, like, like Nikisha is doing, that their kids are fine. So I think that's, um, that's another element is going to be really important. I know Angela Hopkins uh, Hoyt just mentioned that, you know, if you have yard space or a garden, then it's always good to get children to play outside. Children can have games night, movie night. So I guess it's about making things as fun as they can possibly be during correct. this situation. Yeah, correct, Ashley. You know, that's around that time we started our kitchen garden at home. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they are in, involved in gardening even more than I am. Um, you know, there, there were ways in which we, we found different things to do. Um, even my, I have a, a, what do you call it, a keyboard at home, and my youngest taught themselves how to play different songs on the keyboard by going on YouTube. So, you know, just, just find some ways in which you can bring them, um, put them at ease, and make them comfortable with the situation. Brilliant. So we're, we're actually getting to the end of our conversation um, now. I just have... I just have one question for both of you before we go, and that's given that we know that a lot of our English speaking audience are parents whose children have, you know, probably just gone back to school this week, as is the case with Nikisha, or, you know, perhaps they're thinking about going back to school in the imminent future. What recommendations would we have for them, you know, if they're worried about is it safe, is it not safe? Um, what is our main takeaway, I guess, for parents? Should we start with Nikisha? I would say, um, you know, keep watching your environment. Um, be very aware of what's happening around you. Um, no matter what, we have to be. It's a fluid environment. We have flexibility. It calls for agility. It calls for resilience. It calls for us to be able to be one way today and tomorrow. We have to change. Um, and, and I think out of this, I, I think we become a stronger generation and our, our children will be a stronger generation. They'll be more flexible than we were um, in terms of unfortunate circumstance. So it's about being resilient, be agile, be flexible, tap into your network, tap into your friends, your church, your community. Um, and, and that village, as we see in, in the Barbados and Trinidad and in the Caribbean, you know, we have what we call the village, tapping into your village, who can help you with with whatever challenges you face. So don't be afraid to ask for help if you need it. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. And Kitty, what are, what are our recommendations for parents who might be a bit concerned about sending their children back to school at the moment? 
I think the most important thing is to really be aware of what the school is doing and be engaged with that. Understand what the school is doing, work with them, uh, work with your kids when they come home. So, and, and um, really um, work together with the school, with the municipality, etc., cetera, to, to make that place the safest place possible. Um, as we said earlier, children are much less susceptible than adults. Uh, children need to be back in those schools. They need to start learning again they need to start in, in interacting again and in the safest way possible but really as parents be aware of of what happens around you be part of that solution with the schools and um, make sure that uh, you work with the school and with your kids so that um, um, I, I like your point uh, Nikisha it takes a village to raise a child also, no? that's what I also say. So I think that, that's what it is, no? really be part of that community and, um, and know what, what, what happens around you and, and, and um, work together with the, the relevant uh, instances. Well, thank you so much, Hedy, and thank you so much, Nikisha, for joining us today. It's been a great conversation, and I would love to have you back, Nikisha, <laughs> a wonder woman parent from Barbados. So we will be back this coming Friday next week for another episode of Ask the Expert. I think we're going to be doing an update on nine months since the COVID-19 pandemic. So please don't hesitate to join us. There'll be more information about that coming up on Paco's Facebook page. Thank you all for joining us for the past 40 minutes. Thank you to our speakers and we will be back soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.